evening and welcome to this Forum for Philosophy event on science fiction and philosophy. Normally I'd be thanking you for braving the London December weather to join us at the LSE, but we're online tonight, so welcome wherever you are and thank you for adding another online event to what might be a busy day. Uh, this event has been co-sponsored by the British Society for the History of Philosophy and the Royal Institute of Philosophy, so thanks to them. Okay, our topic this evening is science fiction and philosophy, perhaps especially the history of philosophy. Science fiction and philosophy have some shared preoccupations. Zombies, time machines, body swaps, both encourage us to navigate possible worlds and alternative spaces, and perhaps are fundamentally united by a sense of fascination at what might be. Tonight, we'll investigate their shared history, interrogate their boundaries, and try and celebrate their connections a little bit. So the format will be an hour of chat with the speakers, and then I'll leave 15 minutes or so to take some questions from the audience. So let me introduce our speakers. James Burton is lecturer in cultural studies and cultural history at Goldsmiths University of London. Lewis Powell is professor of philosophy at the University of Buffalo, New York. And Lisa Walters is senior lecturer in English literature at the University of Queensland. And I'm Claire Moriarty, a fellow at the Forum and an Irish Research Council postdoc at Trinity College Dublin. James, I'm going to come to you first to kick off. What is science fiction and how do we tend to mark it out from other kinds of fiction and perhaps related genres like fantasy, etc.? Uh, thanks, Claire. Thanks, everyone. This is uh, really, really good to be here. Well, I'm, I'm always here, but um, <laughs> really good to be with you here. Um, yeah, I guess that's 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 a a big question, isn't it? Uh, and one that, 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 you know, there's been huge amounts of debate over, um, including, you know, not just from academics, but from the authors themselves of science fiction or those who consider themselves to be doing or not doing science fiction. I think we, you can always take a very simple sort of what, what you might call the sociological definition um, and say, okay, well, science fiction is, what it appears to be as a publishing category once it appears. And I think it's interesting that that question of uh, what is science fiction often leads into a debate about when does science fiction begin? Because there's lots of arguments about, well, what's the first science fiction work? And defining that depends on you having either an implicit or explicit definition of what makes science fiction. So, you know, with the sociological definition, you might say, well, it, it begins in the early 20th century with publishers like Hugo Gernsback and John W. Campbell in the US um, and the influences on them from the 19th century like H.G. Wells and uh, uh, Jules Verne and uh, Edgar Allan Poe. But then if you take up other arguments and say, well, Brian Aldiss thinks that Frankenstein is the first work of science fiction. Um, why does he think that? Um, or, you know, uh, there's a, an academic, uh, Stephen Clark, who argues that immortality is the defining theme in science fiction. And on that basis, you might say, well, the Epic of Gilgamesh is the first work of science fiction. Or if you take uh, the lunar voyage and say, well, there's nothing more sci-fi than journeys to the moon, then you've got them going back at least 1800 years to um, um, Roman text by Lucian. Um, and I think, um, uh, or there's uh, uh, Voltaire's Micro Mega, which I think Lewis might talk about later on from the 17th century, um, which is, interestingly for us is titled uh, Histoire Philosophique, uh, a philosophical story or history uh, prior to there being a term such as science fiction. And I think ultimately all those are interesting discussions, but there's no need to decide on a single definition. Um, um, I think we should use them and multiply them for, for the purposes of uh, critical thought and sort of understanding what it is we find so valuable in science fiction, if we call it science fiction. Um, um, but ultimately, it's, it's whatever a writer or a reader uh, takes as important about it. Um, I, there's, there's this, I, I suppose there's a, a common question is, well, what's the difference between sci-fi and fantasy? Um, and on, on that line, I, I really like Ursula Le Guin. Uh, I, I don't know if people know, um, she's written some quite critical things about genre. There's a, there's a collection of her stories where she says, well, I didn't want to call them science fiction, so I made up a different genre for each of them. This one's vegetable realism. This one's geriatric realism. This one's mythological fantasy. They're not science fiction. Um, but she does say for her, there is some value. And her distinction there is with, with fantasy, you get to make everything up 
including the rules about how things work, whereas science fiction has to respect uh, most of the scientific rules. Uh, it still makes things up, but it, it, it can only change a couple of them or speculate about how they might change. So that's one interesting um, distinction that often crops up. But I, I say open as possible. Let, let's take speculative fiction, speculative feminism, um, mythological fantasy. Let's take them all as possible science fictional, uh, even, even while respecting that for some people it has to be to do with science or has to be to do with space travel or something. I don't know if others, if the other panelists think uh, we should uh, <laughs> we should have a more specific definition than I than I prefer. Yes, feel free to jump in, folks. Well, we've thought a bit about a broad church a broad church definition, which seems sensible, and then maybe some kind of a tethering to science. Mm. Um, but your work has been kind of at the intersection of science fiction and philosophy. Uh, what you know what what's the relationship between philosophy and science fiction, or you know what are some thoughts about that? Well, I think I think we're going to hopefully talk about lots of different ways in which the two broad spheres overlap in terms of thought experiments, um, concern with uh, Alexandra Aldridge defines science fiction, for example, as a cosmic view of nature. And if you define described in a poetic way, I think so if you take that definition, then you've almost got a definition of philosophy already. Um, I think going back to like what I said about each person could take their own starting point for what they consider important. Uh, for me, like with both philosophy and science fiction, one of the most important things is I think um, a sense of wonder uh, and that a sense of wondering how the world is. Amazement, first of all, that the world is what it seems to be or appears to be what it appears to be. And then a question of, well, how did this come about um, and how could it be otherwise? And of course, maybe you could say, well, um, science and philosophy more often have tended towards that question, how did it come to be? How is the world? Um, whereas uh, science fiction might be more commonly thought of as how is the world going to change? How is the world going to be? But I think actually, what, if you narrow that down, both are engaged in a kind of speculation um, because we don't know exactly how the world is. So both of them are investigations into how the world is uh, and, and also, of course, how it could be different. And I think that difference, it depends on what your interests are. That difference could be ontological, uh, but it also could be political or social. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I, I, sorry, sorry for answering in such a broad way again. Really but, 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 but I, I, you know, I think, you know, Kant, Aristotle, there's a lot of moments in history of philosophy where they say, well, um, philosophy starts with looking up at the starry heavens and this sense of awe at the universe and then going back and trying to figure it out. And I'd say you could say, well, that applies to a lot of science fiction, or at least the reasons I fell in love with science fiction as a younger reader. Do you have well. any favorite examples there where that sense of awe or wonder is particularly palpable? In sci-fi? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think a really almost archetypal example would be in Olaf Stapledon, uh, writing in the 20s and 30s, uh, where and um, the novel, um, uh, Not Last and First Men, uh, uh, a second novel <laughs> where um, he travels basically throughout the length and breadth of the universe, historically and spatially. But it starts with him. He's had an argument with his partner. He walks out of his London house, goes up on a hill and looks up at, and the stars come out and he starts wondering about them and thinking, what, what is this strange world I'm in? And somehow that wonder just pulls him off the lip, off the face of the planet and starts this journey across across the universe where he meets other creatures, other cultures, sees uh, stars come into consciousness, uh, you know, sees other universes come into being. So everything flows from that. Uh, but I think that moment of speculation for me often starts with that that initial that initial wonder. Of course, I think you could add to that. There's always um, I, I would never want to lose the critical dimension of science fiction. So it's not just a question of, oh, look at that. Isn't that nice? Oh, look at that. Beautiful colors. Oh, strange aliens. You know, it's also, you know, um, about, you know, uh, 
okay, there's wonder underpinning this experience of the immensity of the universe, but also there's, okay, there's so much wrong with the world we're in and how do we avoid escapism in speculation and turn it to a more pragmatic or critical uh, approach of changing the way things are, not just not just speculating about all sorts of wondrous beings and, and worlds. Okay, so driven by wonder, but sort of anchored in an anxiety sometimes as well, and seeing seeing how that plays. Yeah, I've made it, I've, I've expressed that quite clumsily, but hopefully it sort of comes across what I'm. Not <laughs> yeah. at all. So maybe, and oh yeah, well, so maybe uh, beyond besides awe and wonder, perhaps science fiction and philosophy both are in their own ways, trying to think about the possibilities of the universe and the human experience. So it's, I see that relating to awe, but would you say that might might be a, a very loose way that we could define these genres? <laughs> I, gu I guess so, yeah. I'm, I guess that's very, that's quite personal to me, um, the, the sort of the starting with a moment of awe. I, I think you could say speculation perhaps is a better way of generally saying the starting point i would i would suggest that both start with a kind of speculation um, which somehow becomes self-fueling as it moves on you speculate you add layers to you, what you've speculated and then that becomes something to look at for further speculation um, maybe something along those lines and there's of course lots of definitions of speculation in philosophy uh, and you know a million different ways to speculate in science fiction but um, yeah. Especially in the 17th and 18th century, there's a sort of politics around speculative philosophy as well. Yeah. Um, but just thinking of what you said there as well about awe and wonder, um, sort of theological themes are pretty potent in both philosophy and science fiction. I'm sure all of you have something to say on this, but um, if anyone would get us started, maybe, maybe James on the relationship between those two in your thinking, and then we can pass it around and see what people think. Yeah, unless anyone wants to, to jump in. I mean, I can, I'll give it a quick a quick start on that. Um, I think, um, obviously, for me, there's that sense of uh, of something miraculous or wondrous about the universe that that, that starts things off. Um, but then I, I think I became very interested in um, the theological uh, theme or strands of of dealing with religion in science fiction, partly because the first big wave of academic criticism on sci-fi in the sort of 70s and 80s, a lot of it was fueled by Marxist critics like Frederick Jameson or Darko Suvan, who were quite hostile to anything towards anything to do with the theological. Um, they thought, you know, coming from a Marxist perspective of the critique of capitalism, and this is science fiction's value, or more generally, science fiction's value should be somehow through utopianism, through a renewed uh, utopia, they thought that, well, anything religious has no place in that. And I think since then, I mean, some of those figures have probably changed their views, but I think since then, across a lot of sort of politically engaged, but also philosophical um, areas that previously wouldn't have dealt much with the religious or the theological, there's more of an acceptance for it. So, it, you know, you've got um, the uptake of, of Pauline theology by Badiou and a Gambon in, in, in political theolo theological philosophy. Um, you've got, you know, Walter Benjamin and capitalism as religion. You've got all sorts of takes now, uh, not to mention kind of all uh, those who look for alternatives to the dominant Western worldview modes of being. So, you know, people like Donna Haraway or Elizabeth Povinelli, who will look at non non Western forms of knowing and being um, that are somehow religious, whether that's animist or some other form of religion. And I think now we're in a climate where um, the theological, the supernatural is, is figuring in science fiction in a much more powerful way, A, because it's clearly a crucial part of everyday life and society, but B, because it also has that power to speculate, to, to, to take a leap outside of everything you know, or to go beyond, go to the edge of what you know. Uh, to, 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 to think about that borderline of what's just beyond the known. So there's the unknown we can't reach, there's the known that we feel comfortable with, and then there's this zone in between, um, you might call noumena or something. Um, I'm not sure if everyone who teaches science fiction in the classroom has this experience, but I find that 
inevitably discussions of science fiction tend to somehow talk about theology as well. Um, mm -hmm. For example, I'm thinking of Ishiguro's Never Let Me Go. I think that would be science fiction since it's about clones. And the whole, one of the issues in the story is whether clones have souls. So already you're raising questions about, well, what is a soul? What, it, and even though the story seems very secular, it raises, I think, because you're thinking about what it means to be human, what, it, what, what the universe might, what the potential the universe might be, there, there's always theological implications. Mm. Lewis, I'm, we're going to move into some of the historical stuff soon, but I'm wondering, is theology an interesting way to get in here? I know you're quite interested in the variety of topics and styles of writing in that period, but maybe theology is kind of a driver in that respect as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, ha I haven't thought about, uh, I mean, there's certainly, I mean, everything in the early modern period is heavily inflected with theology. Um, and certainly uh, there's waves of science fiction uh, periods of science fiction, as James was suggesting, that are sort of anti-theological, and then there's periods of science fiction that are uh, more welcoming to it, and uh, there's parts of it that are less sort of definitively one way or the other. Um, there's some, uh, one of my favorite uh, more recent science fiction collections, uh, it's probably not that recent anymore, uh, Ted Chang's uh, Stories of Your Life and Others, which probably has a different name now after uh, one of its stories was adapted into a movie. Um, but uh, has several sort of theologically related stories in it. Um, so one that's got like Aristotelian preformation stuff going on that has to do with like first mover things, but also uh, one of my favorite science fiction short stories ever is in there called Hell is the Absence of God um, that has like C.S. Lewis type themes in it um, in addition to just interesting science fiction speculation going on. Uh, but I hadn't really thought about just because of the way in which everything science fiction or not in the early modern period is very theological. I hadn't thought about the distinctively theological elements to the science fiction-y parts of the early modern period. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess well, I, I guess wherever, you know, wh where, did, where did our thinking about things beyond the human or beyond nature, the supernatural register until we had something like science fiction or romantic fantasy at least? You know, it was in myth and religious stories. Uh, there's some, we're talking about the beginnings of science fiction, like like giving alternatives for the first science fiction text. At one point, I was very interested in early Gnostic Christian texts, and you get sort of apocryphal stories of Jesus' childhood, where he has powers to zap people who he doesn't like, or parents who uh, tell him off. And it's, you know, you've got superhero stories, you know, effectively. Um, you know, I, anyway, sorry, I, I'm talking too yeah. much about this. So, oh, no. oh, no. And will we, will we start with the philosophers of the early modern period then? We've been sort of thinking about ways in which it's unclear sometimes where to start the story of science fiction, but one, you know, person often thrown out is Francis Bacon. And, you know, as a philosopher in that period, he, you know, he wrote a lot of different kinds of things. But Lewis, is that something you find particularly in that period in a more general way with philosophers? Yeah, so I'm happy if we're, I mean, insofar as we're going to try and come up with a definition of when to start science fiction, I'm happy to say the early modern period is a good one to choose. Uh, although I respect the folks who want to go for uh, Lucian uh, back in, in ancient times, but uh, the early modern period is a great uh, candidate for it um, because there's, there's a lot of good candidate texts uh, in that time period. Uh, Micromegas, which was I apologize, by the way, anytime I try and pronounce something in French, I do it poorly. So I'll just um, <laughs> resign myself to doing it wrong um, instead of trying to get it right. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's a fantastic one. The story there is about um, aliens from other planets who are uh, philosophers. And then they meet and they do a little tour of the galaxy and then they come to Earth and uh, to give a sort of um, two short synopsis, they meet our philosophers and make fun of them, uh, but they make the least fun of the Lockeans uh, because the Lockeans at least are humble enough to recognize that they're probably wrong about a bunch of stuff, uh, as opposed to like the Aristotelians and the Leibnizians uh, who claim to have understood things. Um, and if that doesn't sound quite as like epic sci-fi as like a Star Wars type story, that's correct, uh, but 
it's, it is the character of a lot of the science fiction stories, which is um, sort of a, a polemic against a different type of philosopher than the person who's writing it. So it's, it's a very similar sort of story to Candide, uh, just with aliens um, making fun of the person's philosophy that he's not a fan of um, and a slightly different story structure. Uh, but it's, it's still just a way to uh, trash uh, his, I mean, trash is maybe a little bit base of a way to describe it, but to dig on the people uh, whose philosophy he thinks is not up to snuff. Um, and so you, you see that in a lot of the early modern uh, instances of this kind of story is that it's, it's got a lot of almost explicit uh, I mean, in this case, fully explicit, but it has a lot of like people who are either stand-ins or clearly explicitly voicing a philosophical position. Uh, and then you just have like full on exegetical description of what is wrong with their philosophical position in the text. Um, so it's that like wedding. Fiction allowed people to kind of critique each other more heavily than they could do in explicitly philosophical works or that it kind of opened the door to be a bit more scandalous maybe about your opponent? Well, I mean, I, I feel like I'd probably need to do like a real, well, not me necessarily, someone would need you like a real side-by-side -side case study to see because it's not as though people were always very reserved in their other writings. Um, but I do think uh, I do think in some cases it allowed them, I mean, like certainly in Candide, for instance, which I, which I would not put forward as a case of science fiction, but like I do think in some of these cases, the uh, genre differences that, that we're seeing uh, in the early modern period do give them a little bit more freedom to like excoriate each other than in just straightforward sort of like, here's my essay. Uh, but I think also sometimes it comes down to the character of the person writing it, how far they're willing to go. Um, so I, I think it's a little bit, one wants to be a little bit cautious in generalizing too much just about like, oh, it's because it was a novel instead of a play or a play instead of a poem or what have you. But part of it is just that in the early modern period, people were doing philosophy in so many different ways compared to how it's done now, where right now, you know, if you're writing a piece of philosophy, you're writing uh, a journal article or a research monograph or a book review or like one of three different types of things. And back then people were doing dialogues, they were doing plays, they were doing poems, they were doing uh, pen says sometimes, whatever those are. You know, there was like 15 different genres you could write in and each genre had its own conventions and you know, details of the format and stuff. And so there were all these different ways in which you could sort of situate yourself. And some of them were so that you could hide your true position a little bit more. And some of them were so that you could make your position explicit and explore the details of your opponent's position in different ways. Sometimes you were doing sort of staged public correspondence. All of these different genres were very uh, interesting, different ways to do it. Um, but like the idea that you could just write your philosophy as an extended work of public fiction is just not something that people do now at all as a way to present their philosophy in an academic or like as part of the sort of normal academic community. And that's a huge difference between now and the um, early modern period. Yeah, I guess it's lamentable as well. I mean, there's always questions about whether public philosophy these days really counts as proper philosophy you know, as you say, if it's not peer reviewed, um, it's tended to be treated with a certain kind of, you know, anxiety among certain kinds of scholar. But it's interesting to look how, at how back then, you know, it just was completely natural for philosophers to be thinking about different ways to appeal to different kinds of audience. Well, so I think there's a trade-off um, because uh, in, you know, in that time period, uh, Galileo writes, you know, the dialogue um, that, you know, he writes uh, his uh, dialogues in part in order to avoid getting into certain sorts of trouble for explicitly endorsing a position about, you know, uh, that's at odds with the church. Um, and it's not entirely successful because he, he comes a little bit too close and gets into trouble with the church. Um, but, you know, if everybody wrote their works in that way, it's harder to say, oh, we know what Galileo's view is and we can just attribute a view to Galileo. 
So nowadays it's much easier to be like, oh, I, I know what James's view is about this topic. He wrote it down, it's in the paper. He, he said, there's like a thesis statement at the end of the first paragraph, it's in the abstract. So we have like a clarity gain because we know what James's view is or Lisa's view is or Claire's view is and we can just say, that's what they said. But we did lose a lot of richness in terms of the, the landscape of different ways people can explore things and, and a lot of that stuff. So it's, it's a trade-off, I think. Okay, yeah, I'm just trying to think about how, yeah, like, so Barclay from that period wrote a book that is all questions. And I'm trying to think how that would be, you know, accepted from a contemporary philosopher now, like, would there be any way you could get this published or get away with it? Uh, Lisa, we're going to move on to the to the Cavendish material in a while, but I'm wondering if you want to join in on some of these early modern themes, since that's your kind of domain as well. Yeah, um, you know, I think it's it's interesting because, I mean, Cavendish is actually a really great example of, of a philosopher that likes to explore her philosophical and scientific ideas in literary forms. And she she used nearly every genre available, whether it was poetry, plays, uh, fictional letters or just a dry philosophical treatise. So, um, and I, I think she found fiction actually not just a, a more, perhaps a more pleasurable way to explore her, her science and philosophy, but also it was a, a way to, it was able to do things that she couldn't quite say in a, in a philosophical treatise, if, if that makes sense. So, um, for example, I, you know, I guess kind of, I'm thinking of The Blazing World, which um, if, if you haven't read it and you're um, a fan of science fiction, this is a really interesting case about how we define science fiction, when, when did it start? I, I agree with James in that I don't think I would call it the first uh, science fiction story because there were earlier, there, you know, for example, Serrano de Bergerac was imagining a man traveling to the moon. But I think what's really interesting about this text, in particular, thinking about the origins of science fiction is that um, she imagines it, tropes and themes that you see in science fiction today that I really don't think her predecessors explored. So uh, zombie armies, uh, submarine technology, she imagines an alien civilization on an imaginary planet with its own unique solar system. So she imagines parallel realities, multiple worlds. So um, she's a really interesting case in, in thinking about what, what is science fiction, what, when did it start, but also what's kind of unique about her is that uh, I guess her and other women is that women authors of this period were mostly forgotten until fairly recently. So um, even if they, they might have been very well known, influential during their own period, it really wasn't until the 1980s that people like Cavendish began being noticed again. And kind of people went, oh, this is really interesting. So it's, it, she's often considered a pioneer of science fiction, um, but this has been kind of more of a recent discovery that, oh, 350 years ago, we found this really interesting author who is a woman, um, but we'd forgotten about this. Would you be happy to kind of introduce her and the blazing world? We can come back to some of the other more general themes in a second, but it seems natural to oh, discuss sure. it now. And I know it's not familiar to everyone. So, please. so uh, yeah, actually Cavendish, um, she wrote a, a philosophical text called Observations Upon Experimental Philosophy. And she states that her science fiction story um, is, a, uh, is an appendix to this. So um, for her, it's, it's very important to her that, that her readers see that, that this is part of her philosophical project. It's not isolated. Um, similarly, her first text that she, about over a decade earlier, she wrote a philosophical treatise and her first one, um, she complained in it. She said, I really wanted to publish my book of poems with this because they have a lot in common, um, but the publisher messed up and <laughs> now they're separate. So, <laughs> so for her, she, it, Fiction and philosophy were very uh, interrelated. And um, so in The Blazing World, you have this story of right after she, this long treatise about philosophy of uh, this uh, woman who enters essentially an alien planet or a parallel world, she gains absolute power and she meets bear men and fish men, all these hybrid um, animals and, and insects, there's worm men, and she debates natural philosophy with them. Uh, the story gets pretty strange, um, and it, <laughs> anyone who knows it, uh, it's one of the stranger stories I've ever read. Uh, uh, and uh, essentially, I think uh, it explores a lot of the same issues that she discusses in Observations, but um, for example, the issue she discusses her view of matter and nature, 
the universe, uh, the difference between body and mind, uh, what is soul, all these kind of issues that are important in philosophy, uh, she explodes, explores in her own way in this story, this sort of very fantastical story. There are quite detailed sections in the middle, right, where she's at length doing kind of metaphysics. Uh, oh. I mean, it's interesting for someone who hasn't read as much in the period, but yeah, it's it's very striking. Sorry, James, go on. Oh, oh well, I was going to ask um, both both Lisa and Lewis, um, but especially Lisa, based on what you've just been saying, like, um, so what is it, do you think, that that means she's doing her philosophizing at these points through the fiction? Um, but what is she getting there that she isn't getting, she can't get by another means, or is it just, we don't, there's no way of knowing? <laughs> I, th I think there's a few things that she's doing. Um, one is maybe more basic in that she states um, in one of her editions that she wrote The Blazing World for women because right. women aren't used to reading. Uh, weren't as in, weren't, I don't want to say women didn't do philosophy. Women wrote letters. They were involved in intellectual salons, but she thought that they were not as involved or engaged with philosophy. So mm. she said that, you know, I, I want women to get, essentially I want women to, to get involved. So it's interesting that one of the earliest examples of science fiction was she claims was written for women. Um, and literary scholars sometimes describe it as a romance, which during that period did not mean a love story. Um, mm -hmm. What It was more like fantasy. So um, stories about King Arthur would be described as romance. So they involved adventures, the supernatural. So, but women were, there was a stereotype that women were avid readers of these romances. So she creates, oh, yeah. so she talks so in one sense, she's, it's, it's, all, it's about accessibility. Um, maybe not just women, but just a way to let more people engage with, with philosophy and, and specifically her own ideas. But I think it's also part of her philosophical project in that in observations, uh, she claims that really one of the primary aims of that text is to try to understand human perception. So optics or how we feel, how we perceive. Mm. And she really puts her theories of, of perception against lots of ancient and contemporary philosophers. And one of the things that she really critiques is uh, the, the rising empiricism. So uh, although empiricism is very important to the scientific method today, um, she had a lot of concerns about it that, you know, particularly if you think about 17th century microscopes and telescopes, uh, you know, they, they, they were not like sophisticated like ours. And she was worried that in general, people would be looking too much at the surface of phenomena and not looking deeper in the sense of what we would describe as microscopic phenomena, atoms, or she was really interested in uh, the Epicurean ideas of multiple worlds. So she thought that if you, look at it, the, if you look at the surface of things, if you observe, you're just getting more detail of the surface. You're not looking at the interiority. So she's a little bit more like Descartes in that you're, you know, she wants to look inward for knowledge. Um, and so how that relates to the blazing world is I think it's quite funny because the blazing world explores all these things that empiricism could not capture. You have, again, multiple world, worlds, parallel realities. Um, you have uh, you know, just all kinds of, you know, it's, it's very imaginative. It's, so it's kind of thinking about these things that, that um, you know, so in some ways I see it as an extension of that critique. So I guess, for example, Robert Hooke had argued he was one of the founders of the, the empiricism that, um, you know, imagination is a problem and it's been, it's been, uh, it, it gets in the way of reason and our perception will be cl clearer, our knowledge will be improved if we just focus on, focus on observations of phenomena, don't, don't use the imagination. And mm -hmm. other philosophers tended to be a bit skeptical of, of the imagination as well. Uh, Hobbes, you know, had just said, well, imagination is just decaying sense. It's not really, um, you're not getting really true knowledge from this. So I think Cavendish is doing several things here going, wait a second, the imagination is very important for understanding the world. Um, you know, we, we can think about the world, you know, we can in, in different ways from just observation. And, and it's really important as a medium for trying to understand what it means to be human, what it means, what the universe might be like. The, the world that she imagines has is filled with, I think I mentioned bear men, fish men, insect men. Um, so uh, she's, I, so I think it's, uh, it, it, she's critiquing some of these issues, but in a very different format. I think that format is helpful for her to do that, if that makes sense. I, I find um, that 
Fascinating. Go on, Lewis. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, and the different orders of uh, animal hybrids um, stand in for different categories of philosophical sects. So um, I never remember off the top of my head which ones are which, but like um, the Empress at some point, like specifically requests um, that like the Spider-Men be summoned to explain themselves. And the Spider-Men I think are like the geometers or like geometric philosophers. Um, and then they like can't defend their philosophy to her. Um, and so she's like, there, see, this is, this is bad. And so like, it's, it's very similar to what I was alluding to in the um, Voltaire's Micromegas, where like you have woven into the story, uh, perhaps not as elegantly woven in as one might want, because it does sort of just feel like we've got a little philosophical dis discursus, like just sort of plopped into what is otherwise a sort of uh, narrative. But like put into that story, we just have like sort of a criticism of geometric philosophy um, sort of put in there. And the, so the different types of animal human hybrids um, are standing in for different types of philosophical positions that are being criticized. Um, so it's, uh, I don't know that that's not something that one could in principle accomplish with a treatise. Like it might be that it's sort of doing double duty with what's going on in uh, the observations on experimental philosophy, but um, it is sort of being done in the, in the novel as well. Yeah, it's a way of using maybe satire and, and humor in a way that you may not quite get in a, in a, in a drier text. And, and, uh, and as Lisa was suggesting, activating it through the imagination and fancy rather than just sort of the, you know, pure ratio or what have you. I mean, in thinking about critiquing philosophers, there's a point in the story where the protagonist, the empress, has a discussion with Margaret Cavendish, who's a, inserted as an actual character in the story. Um, and they decide, let's create our own philosophical worlds. And they, they, they try to make worlds from Epicurus, from Aristotle, Hobbes, Descartes. And it's funny because Cavendish was friends with, with Descartes and Hobbes and they were those, those guys, particularly when she lived in Paris, they were frequent visitors to her household. And she pretty much, they, they go, no, I don't like this. Actually Hobbes gives her a headache, which is <laughs> funny. <laughs> um, and they decide to just make a philosophical world or how I see it as like an epistemology or a system um, that's not based on any intellectual authorities just on their own and, and they love it. And it's, I think it's kind of, particularly for someone who is not formally educated because women couldn't go to universities, it's really showing, look, more people can, you, you don't have to be trained by these philosophers to enjoy philosophy. Um, you know, she can critique them in that way, but also it's a, she's, she's showing that um, you know, philosophy can be for, um, for anyone really. And, and she uses the, that medium of fiction to, to show that. Well, the way you describe that, it reminds, it makes, it makes it sound a bit like the lathe of heaven by Ursula Le Guin, where you have a protagonist who turns out that his dreams change reality. So every night, a diff reality is changed by his dreams and he goes to a psychiatrist and they get this megalomaniacal utopian project. Let's dream up a perfect world. And they go through various iterations of trying to get it right based on different philosophical takes. So, yeah, um, but that's incredible. I'm, I'm fascinated by how, you know, if, if you took that sociological definition that I started with and say sci-fi begins around 1880 or 1920, it then takes a couple of generations before we get properly feminist um, science fiction or, you know, women writers um, not just presenting more of the same kind of science fiction. And yet, 300 years earlier, before Le, Le Guin, you've got Margaret Cavendish. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, this is one of the things I find amazing. <laughs> Um, another work of hers that I uh, literally can't help myself from mentioning whenever I talk about Cavendish is a poem called A Dialogue Between an Oak Tree and a Man Chopping It Down, uh, which is my absolute favorite of hers. It's, uh, I think it, it's, uh, I, again, as long as we're doing the like, whether or not something is um, science fiction, it's like hard to argue that that one's science fiction. It, it would be easier to make it fantasy, I guess. But um, it's just... Uh, it is what, what it says on the tin, I guess. It is a dialogue between an oak tree and a man chopping it down. I like to call it the reverse giving tree. Uh, if you're familiar with the children's book, The Giving Tree, because it's a, a man chopping down an oak tree. And then the oak tree's like, why are you trying to cut me down? And the man's like, wouldn't it be great to be a boat? And the oak tree's like, no, I'm actually pretty good as an oak tree. 
And the man's like, no, wouldn't it be so fun to be on the ocean? And the oak tree's like, I'm actually really good right here being an oak tree. And so it just goes back and forth. And the man just keeps trying to sell the tree on, you know, adventures on the ocean or like being part of a house. And the tree is like, actually, no, it'd be great if you just left me alone. Uh, and so like that one, I think, uh, I don't know how you could do that one, not as a, as a poem or at least a work of fiction. Like it would be much harder to understand how you could do as effectively what she's doing there in anything that wasn't sort of a uh, narrative mode. Um, and there's definitely parts of Blazing World that have that feature to them and a lot of her poems. But there are some of her poems that are more in that mode of um, it's, it's just a philosophical argument that rhymes uh, or has meter to it, which is also like what um, Alexander Pope does with the essay on man, which is a poem that uh, calls itself an essay, which is a fair label, like where it is just a philosophical argument with a meter and some rhyme to it. So I think it goes sort of both ways where there's stuff sort of splitting the genre in either direction for her and for lots of people in that time period. Yeah, and I think, she, I think she also was trying to model her, poem, her poetry on Lucretius who was trying to explain Epicurean um, science and philosophy and ethics through poetic form. So, I, I think you're right, she's exploring science, but she's used, she's really interested in language. So the way that language can be used um, in different forms. And I think one of her philosophical premises is that all of matter is alive, is has some kind of consciousness, even if we don't recognize it as such, or it might be a kind of consciousness that we can't understand, but uh, which is very different from her contemporaries where matter was seen as, and body as very passive and, and corrupt, something that, that was you know, gross compared to mind and spirit. And for her, um, body is, and, and corporeality matter is very important. And so um, kind of thinking about what she's, uh, what she's doing in her literature, she's you, you, talking to a tree, she's kind of showing how, I think she's very interested in trying to get the perspective of trees, of animals. And because she argues uh, that, that they have their own type of knowledge, even if we can't understand it. We, you know, she says, you know, at one point, fish can understand the ocean in ways that we can't. So I, I think uh, literature is, and, and the different genres in literature, like poetry can be really useful for her to kind of try to represent that I idea that you were talking about. But yeah, I love the poem of the, the, the tree going, nah, I, want to, I just want to be a tree. <laughs> I love the idea of making these perspectives possible that are not available maybe in straightforward philosophy. Another way I suppose we investigate those possibilities in that kind of literature is through thought experiments, um, mm -hmm. which again, as we were saying in the introduction, is something that is used heavily in, in both genres. Uh, Lewis, do you, would you tell us a bit about the thought experiment in early modern philosophy maybe and, and how it crops up in the lit? Sure, yeah, so um, thought experiments, I mean, one way to think about thought experiments is that they are very, 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 very short stories. Um, so uh, they often take about like a paragraph. So um, there's uh, like one, one of my favorites from uh, like John Locke's essay concerning human understanding uh, is a thought experiment that is called Locke's Locked Room. It's very easy to remember that one because it's got like a nice alliterative name. Um, in Locke's Locked Room, uh, Locke says, imagine that you are taken while asleep and brought to a room. You wake up and uh, you are in a room with someone that you would love to spend time with. I know after this long during pandemic conditions, it might be hard to imagine that there's anyone you'd like to be uh, in a room with. You'd like to maybe not uh, have that experience anymore. You'd like to just be outside and free. But uh, okay. Locke says, imagine that you are taken into a room and you wake up and you're in the room with someone you'd love to spend time with. Uh, and unbeknownst to you, um, that, that's why you were brought to the room asleep, uh, the door is locked. And so you are not actually free to leave the room, uh, but uh, that's okay, because you don't want to go. Um, you're happy to spend time in the room. So like maybe you wake up and your favorite actor or actress or musician or whoever in the world is in the room. And so you just love to be in the room and just sit there talking to them, but it turns out you're not free to go. And so Locke's point in introducing this story is to distinguish between uh, staying in the room voluntarily uh, and lacking the freedom to go. So he wants to point out that freedom and voluntariness are different things because you're staying voluntarily, but you don't have the freedom to leave, right? So you, you couldn't leave the room if you wanted to, but hey, you don't want to. So these are different concepts. 
you're staying of your own volition, but you could not leave even if you wanted to, so you do not have the freedom to go. That's how Locke deploys a thought experiment, short story. He's also got sci-fi thought experiments where he's like, what if you uh, think about this uh, prince and this cobbler uh, and they swap minds right after one of them commits a murder? Who do you put in jail? The body of the cobbler or the body of the prince? Um, and then you think, wait, I saw a Disney movie like that one time. They made a whole movie out of that. But Locke just mentions it for like a paragraph. And then he says, it's obvious you put the body with the murderer's mind in it, not the body that committed the murderer. You put the, the mind that committed the murderer in jail. Um, that's, that's all the time he spends on it. So he, his thought experiment takes very little amount of time. Um, now, science fiction novels, they're very long. Locke's thought experiment takes a very small amount of time. Uh, I, I would compare the use of thought experiments in philosophy as sort of like precision tools versus uh, like an Ursula Le Guin novel, like The Dispossessed uh, is like, you know, several hundred pages exploring how the individual uh, relates to society and like the concept of possession and property and privacy, how those interrelate. Um, and so it's less of a precision tool and more of like a real deep dive exploration. Hmm. Um, and so like Locke has a real hyper-focused goal and that's very different from what's going on in like a book length treatment, which is much more exploratory. And then I'll stop talking because I feel like I just said a lot. I think well, that really makes sense. Can, can I can I add to that? I, th I think that that I think that yeah that you know in a way what we could say about or I would say about some science fiction in that in the terms you've just been using is that it's something like a thought and affect experiment um, that it gets you into this dimension of the lived experience of this uh, thought experiment. So if you take like uh, Philip Dick's The Man in the High Castle, right? Um, the thought experiment is what if the Allies lost the Second World War and in 60s America was ruled by uh, Japanese stroke Nazi, uh, you know, uh, overlords. Um, but then it's the experience of daily life, a guy running to r running his shop, experiencing everyday forms of racism um, that comes through, not, not just the great big picture. Or Le Guin, like you, um, uh, the left hand of darkness, again, you can say, okay, what would it be to be in a society that doesn't have gender at least in any recognizable binary sense that we recognize it. And that's obviously something that wouldn't be answered by just, well, it'd be like this in one sentence. It's sort of, what does it feel like? What's the experience of that? And it gets you some way towards that, which is impossible by just trying to, <laughs> you know, uh, I suppose just to abstractly reason it out or something. Or even I think of Frankenstein, what would, what would happen if we could create life, humans create life? It, what would that what would that mean what would that creature be like um mm. could it be educated i, I think uh so again I, I think that's another thought experiment thinking about the limits of of or not limits but the possibilities of of humans but is yeah. this a problem is this good what 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 would what could potentially happen what are the downfalls exactly yeah although i i found the the, the monster initially quite sympathetic at first mm -hmm. Um, so we've about 10 minutes left of us chatting before the Q&A and I thought it would be nice maybe to talk about the theme of utopias and dystopias because they kind of present an opportunity for science fiction to do political philosophy or to do sort of politics as philosophy. Um, I don't know would anyone like to get us started on some of their sort of favourite examples of how this works, of how authors use utopias or dystopias to, to try and make certain kinds of political point. <coughs> Go ahead. Well, oh, um, I don't know if this would necessarily count as science fiction, but I think it was an important um, predecessor to a lot of texts that might be considered science fiction in, in the early modern period. Um, and Thomas More wrote Utopia in the early 1500s. And I think he really showed how when you present a different society that's organized in completely different ways, um, and I think this is something you see in science fiction a lot, um, that there's a, there's, there's a sort of implicit or intended critique of our current society. So in Utopia, Moore's Utopia, uh, there's no poverty. Um, 
women and men have almost this, are almost equal. Women could be priests. And I, I, so I think it, oh, there's no private property. And if you think about this is in the context that, of a, a feudal world that he's writing in, um, it's really denaturalizing, denormalizing, like it's sort of suggesting, wait, they're, they're, societies could be run in completely different ways with, under, with different values. And I, I, I think, and again, utopia may not quite deal with science, but it, I think a lot of science fic fiction deals with that issue of displacement, disorientation, look at a different world, a different civilization that's very different from our own. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, Resonate I with you. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think um, that, um, I mean, one of one of the issues, if you're trying to think a political utopian project is the fact that it doesn't exist. There's no example to draw on. So you've got to come up with one, right? So if, if you want to talk about a post capitalist society, well, we don't really have any examples, we might have small examples of something like that, or a non capitalist society. But in terms of conceiving how it works, you know, often people will go to sci-fi whether they're you know political theorists or um uh, literary authors and, uh, and the same with what i was just saying about Le Guin and a society without gender or a society without racism or colonialism um i do think i do think it, but there's also i think in terms of um apocalypse and uh, societal collapse there's also a kind of a pragmatic value. I mean, if, if you take um, Octavia Butler's um, parable novels, I mean, reading them now, they look like preparation for the pandemic fueled collapse of civilization under right wing dictatorship. It's kind of, and, and what's gonna happen to everyone. They almost look like training manuals for how to survive it. Um, um, and even really popular things like take the walking dead or something it's really interesting to look at and say well what gets what survives the apocalypse some form of well money doesn't really racism doesn't survive the apocalypse in the walking dead but the nuclear family or the fantasy of the nuclear family as the bedrock of social society uh, structure that seems to survive and certain manly values of you know competition and violence and um, defending ourselves against the attackers all survive. I think it's often interesting what gets left out and what doesn't. Um. Lewis, I wonder, um, are any of these themes resonating for you? Well, so I was thinking about how um, like one uh, prominent, it's not quite the model of the of a thought experiment, although it, I mean, sometimes it is presented that way is like, a lot of people are giving either just so stories or thought experiment versions of like the social contract in the early modern period to explain or justify the role of the state. So they're thinking about like, what was the state of nature like and how did people come to agree on the existence of government? Um, and so they give these sort of like uh, quasi fantasy stories about like, oh, well, people were just kind of like in a Robinson Crusoe style island nation and then they like met each other and they agreed to cooperate and then they agreed that somebody should get to hold the conch and then that person became the king type stories. Um, or they give like the Hobbesian version of it was a war of all against all. So like the end of Lord of the Flies and then they agreed that was bad and they decided to have a government and civil society. And um, so they, they give some version of that story to establish like why there's a social contract in civil society. And then um, you have uh, uh, some genres of utopian or dystopian fiction that are really exploring that thought experiment or that just so story and taking it to an extreme or thinking about what society looks like under these like apocalyptic scenarios. Um, but some of them are sort of explicitly influenced by that. So one uh, science fiction series that I um, have been a huge fan of and is, uh, I think the fourth book is coming out soon is called Terra Ignota by um, Ada Palmer, who's a professor uh, in the history department at the University of Chicago um, is a fantastic series that is explicitly influenced by Hobbes and other early modern thinkers. Um, and so uh, early modern and Renaissance are like a bit earlier than early modern, I think. Or, or it's difficult because different disciplines have the timelines. To, uh, so it might be early modern for some disciplines and just not for, anyway, uh, Renaissance and earlier thinkers. Um, so anyway, uh, but like there is a, a group in this science fiction novel that are explicitly defining themselves by their allegiance to the Hobbesian idea of a, an absolute monarch. 
and others who have chosen to like live outside the rules of society and think of themselves as living in this sort of war of all against all. And it's, it's a fascinating exploration of that concept. And so even though it's not early modern philosophy, it's very inspired by and rooted in it. And it's a fascinating science fiction story that's connected with these sort of Hobbesian thought experiments. Uh, so that's what my mind went to in connection with that question. So I'll just give a shout out to Terra Ignota series by Ada Palmer. Brilliant. Sounds great. Um, so one of the things I wanted to ask about what I haven't really is the sort of role of the state of contemporary science, but I'm going to move into audience questions because one of them has captured this very nicely. So George Chen says, there have been various periods in sci-fi, the golden age, new wave, cyberpunk, but recent sci-fi works tend to have more diverse themes and not have a central focus. Is that because the development and specialization of technology has made science harder to be fantasized? I don't know if anyone would like to take that up. <laughs> well, I don't know what others think, but I, I often find myself feeling like there's some imaginary threshold that got crossed. I don't know when it was, maybe around 2000, 2000 or something, where all of the things that were associated with uh, mainstream sci-fi as futuristic became present, right? You know, smartphones and tablets and this kind of thing, what we're doing now. Um, and then, you know, um, drones, uh, you know, flying, you know, okay, we haven't got jetpacks and we, we're not all taking bus trips to Mars yet, but it's now something that's feasibly talked about in our society. And we have um, Elon Musk and big investors spending billions to, to achieve these things. So it feels like a lot of stuff when I was a child was completely far away, that'll never happen, is suddenly now part of the everyday discussion of technology. It's within the scope of possibility which might have helped us to, it might have helped science fiction to shift that image a bit now that it deals with so many more wide ranging social and political themes, but also maybe goes to, has to go for a further edge. So Ji Chin Lu was, was mentioned in the, 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 the write up for this event. And, you know, there you have someone really looking for, well, what's the furthest extent of current scientific theory that I could imagine embodied? you know, um, materials made of a single string of atoms or um, a planet with, with three different um, uh, planetary bodies revolving to create weird climate patterns and, and, and so on. Anyway. Yeah. It would be very ironic if 2001 was the precise point at which that happened. I suppose so, yeah. I don't know why I, that, that picture came up in my head. I guess it's probably like halfway through my life or something like that. I wonder if that has anything to do with um, the way that science fiction has become a, a genre that I think has a lot more status than it used to have. Um, I guess I'm thinking, you know, it, it's much more common now to see science fiction literature courses. I don't think you would have seen that 40, 50 years ago. So do you, do you think maybe it's because science has become in some ways so kind of to go back to the beginning of the conversation. So um, that there's so much wonder and awe and it's really going in, in different, you know, doing so much, so many things that we never imagined before that maybe that's why science fiction is, I, I would argue that's more prevalent in TV as well. You might, I don't, I, would you say, I, or? I don't know if it's why it, why it is, but it seems to have managed to shake off that dominant image that was, yeah. you know, teenage boys with amazing stories, comics, or I, I mean, uh, again, I, sorry, I keep going back to Ursula Le Guin, but she's amazing. But the famous <laughs> carrier bag of fiction uh, piece that she wrote where she, you know, she says, well, there's this one story about evolution, about how we all came to be, which is basically 2001. Oh, there it is again. <laughs> that was completely unintentional. The film 2001 this time, apes committing murder with a big stick. And then it becomes a spaceship with a human boy fetus without a womb or anything. And this is one, it's, you know, man and conquest and so on. And then there's the carrier bag theory, which is about collecting things that are valuable to you and bringing them all together in a single recipient. And she's saying that that is, that is, so in a way there are two images. There's the old space travel war with aliens. Um, let's bash up the, the insectoids or the spider things. And then there's Ursula Le Guin and a completely different approach and somehow I don't know what it is that's caused that shift. I don't know if it's to do with science and technology particularly, or just 
a bit more maturity um, and the time it takes for generations of readers to grow up and start doing their own things with, with these tools that they've admired, but perhaps have been more circumscribed culturally to, you know, towards masculine or, or other modes of um, writing. I have another great question here. Um, so it's, it's Katie Hefner. So contemporary scholarship on science fiction has often been contextualized by the readers, actors and fans that have engaged within these publishing communities. Uh, is there fandom in the early modern period with uh, these science fictional texts? What sort of textual transactions are actors, readers and writers engaging in with the texts you've identified? Hmm. I'd love to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I think Do we know anything about Cavendish's readership then, or is that something that's, that's known yeah, you sort of mentioned well, about her intentions? Um, well, I guess going back, I'll, I'll start first with, I, I think she's drawing on a lot of different philosophical ideas, but I, I think she actually is working from Thomas More's Utopia. But, um, you know, because Thomas More is a character in his text and she's a character in her science fiction story. So I think there is a little bit of fandom there and she seems to be exploring some, you know, some similar ideas, but a much more fantastic and scientific setting. So I, I don't know if I'd call the blazing world fandom, but um, there are some clear parallels um, with that literary text. But um, as far as her readership, it, because women authors, it, it, this is such a new field of study for women in that period. Um, we're only really beginning to understand her, what her readership was. And there was a, initially there was an idea that Nobody was reading Cavendish, she was unknown or ridiculed. And it turns out actually she had a quite a lot of fans and a lot of men really liked her work as well and, and would initiate correspondences with her. So, um, and I would argue that, that, I don't know if this is veering too far away from that question, that Cavendish played a really key role in changing women's relationship to science and philosophy. After Cavendish, you see um, women such as Aphra Bain writing a poem about Adams, translating Fontanelli's um, A Discovery of New Worlds, which is Epicurean science um, and the idea of multiple worlds. So uh, Lucy Hutchinson after Cavendish translated is the first person to translate an entire, um, uh, the, the entire um, uh, De Rerum Natura, which is a, a poem by Lucretius. I think I mentioned earlier, it's, just, it's the poem about Epicurean science. So it's also interesting to me that so many women of this period were interested in Epicurus, um, who he allowed women and slaves into his philosophical school. So that might be one of the reasons why there, there was such a, an affinity with women and this, this field of philosophy. So I, I think I kind of went, <laughs> I, I, I think, I, did I answer that question? <laughs> I enjoyed it. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, let me preface my response by saying uh, I don't have the best insights into like the reception of her specific like individual works that she released. Um, so I I'm gonna preface by pointing to two resources for people who are curious about Cavendish that I know of that, I, that people who wanna know more about Cavendish should know about. Number one is Duke University's Project Vox, which is a great resource for people who wanna know about early modern women philosophers. Um, I don't think it's related to the to the more well known internet Vox um, like uh, news service. Um, so that's Project Vox V O X, um, and then also New Narratives in Philosophy .net is another site that's um, you know helping with this resurgence of interest in early modern women philosophers. Um, so those two sites are going to be good places to go if you want to start looking into women philosophers in the early modern period. Um, the other thing I was going to say is um, sort of following up on some of what Lisa was saying about the popularity of Cavendish during her own time. She, this is not someone who sort of like was languishing in obscurity and just sort of being funded by her. Uh, I mean, part of why she was able to do what she was doing is because she was an aristocratic woman who was uh, had resources because she was part of the nobility, but uh, or not, I don't know, nobility, but like because she was well situated, but she was in fact uh, well received during her time. Um, and I do know that like as part of her, what we would probably now call activism, though I don't think it was labeled that at the time, she was like doing pamphleteering, pamphleteering and things while she was alive and like actively trying to get people engaged in all sorts of stuff um, and was successful at it. Um, and so like, I think she was a well-known like bit of a celebrity figure at the time. Um, and I think so, like extrapolating from that, I think her poems and fancies and uh, novels and plays were uh, 
uh, at least reasonably known at the time, though I don't know like how much there was like a fan club beyond what, what Lisa has said. Can I hijack Katie's question by suggesting that, I mean, I know the Royal Society in many ways was founded by a bunch of people responding to Bacon's New Atlantis and the idea of, or Nova Atlantis, and then the idea of a kind of scientific committee of people who do experiments. Is that one way to think of, you know, a specific response in the readership? Yeah, I guess, if, I mean, so if, if that counts as fandom, she was the first woman uh, to, uh, maybe, was it the only, uh, she, was, she was definitely the first woman to be allowed to present to the um, Royal Society. Um, and uh, she, you know, I believe scandalized them a bit when she was not such a fan of Hook. Um, and I mean, in her published writing, she compares the fascination with Hook and the micrographia as like boys playing in the snow and being rewarded for like building snow forts basically. Um, so she was definitely not a fan of how much everybody loved microscopes um, and how impressed they were with looking at small things. And in her literature and philosophy, she doesn't hold back. She will really critique pretty well established famous philosophers. And um, so she got, she did get some criticism as well, but I mean, considering I, I think it's actually could have been far worse <laughs> considering and what just, she did for other people. Yeah, and just to contextualize that, she thought that there were more important things for people to be spending their scientific energies on like building bridges and like houses for people and making sure everybody had food. She thought those were more worthwhile scientific endeavors to like prioritize. It's not that she just thought like, who cares about microscopes? Although there is a, a, an element of that to her tone. And then one on sort of the role of um, sci-fi here from Jamie Woodhouse. So sci-fi often manages to break free of current traditions and social norms. Does that make it uniquely placed to help us develop our real world philosophy? Um, my favorite examples often seen are naturalistic epistemology, given the science uh, and sentiocentric ethics. So moral circles, including non-human sentience. So any thoughts on you know, how science, science fiction is uniquely placed to help us develop real world philosophy? Is everybody looking to me to start that one? I yeah. Think, yeah. <laughs> That's one thing that we're not in a we're not actually in a pub or a lecture theatre, so we can't actually be we don't know who we're looking at, do we? Uh, maybe Lewis, if you've got something. Um, I mean, I think uh, I think it does. I think science fiction does allow you to step outside of your own sort of narrowly circumscribed blinders to a certain extent. Uh, but I think uh, like there's. There's a sort of criticism of uh, uh, this uh, thing that Descartes does at the beginning of the meditations, which is that Descartes asks you to sort of like go through all your beliefs and throw them all out, all the ones that are subject to the least bit of doubt. And that sounds like a great method of like spring cleaning your mind and getting rid of all the, the junk. Um, but one problem is like, uh, because you are still situated in your own moment and your own like limited perspective, you're, you also don't know which of the things are actually junk and you don't know that you've gotten rid of all of them and you don't know that you've actually done all of the cleaning. So I think when we look back at all the things that people question at different times, um, sometimes people do a great job of making these breakthroughs. So you go back and you look and you're like, you marvel at the fact that Conway envisions a heaven in which like even animals become vegetarians and stop eating other animals and like, there's like a very like bold thing and you might ask yourself, wow, like is, is uh, Cavendish an animal rights, uh, like ahead of her time animal rights person, although rights isn't the right way to think about it because she's not using the language of rights or whatever. But you, you might ask yourself a question like that. Um, I, I, by the way, I should cite that that's, uh, I, I uh, heard a talk by um, a great philosopher named Deborah Boyle, who's the one who uh, I learned about that question from. Um, but that um, that question, like that's, you know, sometimes people are able to step outside of their bubble in that way. But then you look back and you think like, also sometimes people step outside of their bubble and they, they like, they bring a lot of their bubble with them still uh, when they do that. And so there's a question to how much the, the science fiction uh, conceit actually helps you question of it, I would say. And so, I don't know whether it's like uniquely helpful in doing that because sometimes people, you know, without science fiction can still think, hey, maybe we shouldn't eat animals 
and they didn't need science fiction to do it. And sometimes people with science fiction still imagine very similar worlds to the one that we're living in. So uh, I think it's a mixed bag. That's a very non-committal answer on that front then. But I, mean, well, but I guess another way to think about that question is just to say, you know, which science fiction do you think gives the best philosophical lessons or something like that as well? So I don't know if the, other, if the others have any thoughts on, on that. Well, Ursula Le Guin. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be that again. So, <laughs> in terms of what you were saying, Lewis, you could say, well, on the one hand, is science fiction useful for me to do this, to arrive at this moral position or this philosophical position? On the other hand, you could say, well, if you're speculating in this way, you're science fictionalizing. Doesn't matter if it's published with a starry cover or something. That we could, it depends what we define science fiction as, doesn't it? It could be an activity that we call science fictional and there's no mutual exclusivity with philosophizing or, or, or thinking in certain ways. So that's possible. Um, and I, I, I think just on the question, I, I was thinking that, um, one of, I don't know if this is what was intended by the question, but there are by definition certain events that can only happen once. Um, and I think, for example, the end of humanity, right? Or the destruction of the universe. I mean, philosophically, you can conceive of ways they can happen more than once, but um, experientially, they're unique. And that's one area I think that, that science fiction can be sort of practically useful in the sense that there is no way to experience an asteroid wiping out all of humanity, but we can quasi experience it through this speculative form. Um, Reminds me of Wells, the time machine where he goes into the future and, and this is in the area of Darwinism where the idea that humans were you know, just getting better and better uh, this idea of progress and he, he goes well into the future and humans have actually you know they're they're actually less sophisticated they're worse and then he goes even further in and it's basically just giant crabs everywhere <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. that's oddly reason. prescient given those news articles about how everything keeps evolving into crabs <laughs> 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 One very last question then, um, because we're just running out of time. So this is from Sylvia Wenmakers. A lot of popular science reporting is influenced by science fiction, but also the way scientists themselves think and talk about parts of what they're doing uh, or what they're doing is influenced by it. Some philosophers now aim to deconstruct the distortions this causes in the public and internal perception of science. For example, the overselling of results in AI and images that are used in this context. Do any of you have any thoughts about this? Did this happen in earlier, earlier periods as well? Can you so, think of examples in earlier periods of that? It's hard to say, isn't it? Because we don't have the same kind of science or public, public science that we had previously. And I think also the early modern period is uh, considered proto-capitalist. So, and not everybody wanted to circulate their ideas in print. So today we tend to associate publications with mm. ownership. You, you publish something, it's yours. But in, in the period that we've been talking about quite often, it was, it was if it was actually more prestigious to not publish your work, but to circulate it into different intellectual society, intellectual groups or people, and they might comment or add. So um, I guess thinking about the marketing of, of early modern material, it gets just a little bit complicated because it's a different economic system that, that they, they were living in. Well, on that complicated note, I'm afraid we are actually at time. So usually if we were, at the you know the event in person I would be asking the audience to thank you but all I have to give is my humble thanks to you the speakers uh, on behalf of the forum and thank you very much to the audience and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get through more of the questions because there were loads of fantastic ones uh, waiting in the wings but thanks very much. Mm -hmm.